This evening, the Phaedo, Plato's Phaedo. Of all the dialogues, this is the dialogue that has created the most difficulty for a community of scholars to deal with than all the other dialogues. I presented two papers, one at a college and a major thesis I presented. It caused so much disturbance there that I won't finish the story. <laughs> The next time was at an international conference on Plato, second annual conference, and I gave a paper on the Phaedo, and I was urged by <clears throat> one of the speakers there to forward it to a major journal, and they held it, and they held it, and finally they sent back a rejection. And I asked, of course, why it was rejected, and so I have a warning I must give you. I have it in print, in handwriting, along the side of this page, and it said, if Pierre Grimes is right about his understanding of the Phaedo, there's 2,000 years of Western scholarship that is just simply wrong. So let me give you a view. Now, I've warned you. This is the heretical side of wisdom. We are going to tie together four ideas. The most difficult one is the philosopher, or as he calls it, the true philosopher. Death, wisdom, immortality. Now, as I proceed through this, I'm going to take you through, as it were, uh, the dialogue itself. I've selected many of the key quotes that will explore this notion, and that's where we're going. So, after due warning, we can begin. Therefore, I've set down what I consider the great paradoxes. Now, there's one. But this is a better one. All right, five of them. beginning of the dialogue, Socrates, this is, this is, of course, the death scene. This is the last day of his life. He's in the jail. He's waiting the hemlock. That's the sentence because he violated the laws of Athens, and this is his punishment. So he has his friends over for the last day, and he's engaging in a discussion. And the first point he makes is to a poet, Evanus. And he tells evidence through this spokesman. He says, look, I'd like you to give him a message for me. And that is, if he's wise, to come after me as quickly as you can. Well, everyone's upset at that thought. I mean, what a nice greeting and what a, what a nice thing to say to someone. Drop dead. Come after me as quickly as you can. That's just going to be his death scene. Now, we have to make sense of this. In what way does Socrates mean that? If you're wise, axi, notion of wisdom, if wisdom is playing a role in your, your psyche, then you better come after me as quickly as you can, for that is wise. And he adds to it. And he says, so will every man who has any worthy interest in philosophy. And at this point, he's going to separate philosophy, the every way, every day of thinking of it, to his or the true philosophy. So, if you have an interest in philosophy, the next time you meet another philosopher, just say, drop dead. And their response should be, I'm trying. <laughs> and we have to make sense of that joke. He says, the reason why anyone worthy has a worthy interest in philosophy should follow me as fast or as quickly as possible is because when dead, we know 
that did attain the greatest blessings. Who? Those who have a worthy interest in philosophy. Another paradox. So there are five. Then he pulls it together and he says, look here, it's really essential that you understand that this idea of death is not understood. And of course, two of the people in the dialogue don't understand it, thank goodness, so he has to explain it. So this is his statement. He calls them the many. The many. The many. They do not know in what way, I wrote it in twice, right? In what way the real philosophers desire death, and they don't know in what way they deserve death, and they don't know what kind of death it is. So at the end of this, we should go back and see whether now we can understand why real or true philosophers desire death, deserve it, and then we have to figure out what kind of death it is. Now look here. That curious because normally people think there's only one kind of death. They say, no, 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 no. We have to know what kind of death. Therefore, there has to be several different concepts or ideas of death. Therefore, he then takes a bold statement to make it clear for the rest of the dialogue what he means by death. And death is, that's where he puts it, death is the separation of the soul from the body. Right? And here in this beautiful picture, Right. Here lies, and here are some daisies being pushed up. Right. And at that moment, there should be the separation of the soul from the body. So, death is the separation of the soul from the body, one. Now he makes another distinction which is important to him, but the state of being dead, hey, the state of being dead, it's not the same thing as death. The state of being dead is when the body separates from the soul and exists alone by itself, and the soul separates from the body and exists alone by itself. And therefore, all right, there is a separation and a continuous separation. Each alone by itself. Each alone by itself. Each alone by itself. That, therefore, is the state of being dead. Right? That's much different than death. That's the state of being dead. So the separation would be the process I don't know. I mean, the I death would be the process of the separation. I don't know. I'm trying to understand the distinction that you're making. Well, we, we only made one, which is why you're having a problem. Between death and the state of being dead, right? Th that's right. right. We only covered this one, you see. So you should be puzzled. Both what's being said and the difference between the two. Yeah, you should be something, yeah, you should be puzzled. Therefore, you should have the paradox. Thank you, you've got the paradox. Right. So we've achieved the first level of meaning. Now, go back. What do we have to find? One, why anyone <clears throat> who is wise will go as fast as they can, as quickly as they can after Socrates, right? And so will any man who has a worthy interest in philosophy? And what can be expected? When dead, they'll attain the greatest blessings. And this is something the many do not know. One, two, three. Desire, deserve, and kind. All right, keep them together. Right, that's right. Desire, deserve, and what kind of death it is. All right, now let's see whether we can unpack the paradox. And it's a lovely one. Now all of these, if you have an interest in it later, I can give you the page sightings. All of the material I'm putting up today, as I always do, comes out of the text. These are all quotes from the text. So 
So first, he says, look here, there's a separation. Now we're taking the second, right? pardon me, the first one I'm at. This is number two. The first is the separation. Right, of the soul from the body. <clears throat> Here's a look here. When you are withdrawing from the pleasures of the body, that's a separation of the soul from the body. That's an ethical. That's an ethical. Or, you may just want to pull it off for a while. Right, so in any case, this is an ethical. Right. Equally well, when a person's concern for the body and everything that is attached to it, right, especially clothes and things of that nature, physical concerns. When you turn away from the bodies and the interest in the body, maintaining clothes, shoes, he mentions a great number of things like that. That's not necessarily ethical as much as it is withdrawing from all the things that one desires for the body. So that's a kind of death. That's a separation of the interest of the soul from the body. Now he shifts. He says, when there is a search for knowledge and wisdom in thought, in thought, well, he says, you think best when there is a separation from the soul from the body at such times, when you're concentrating on something and you want to do your best to try to master some issue in philosophy, all the intrusions that the body makes during such studies is an interruption. And therefore, when you really want to get into your studies, you want to be removed as much as you can from the body. And that is a kind of separation of the soul from the body. So each of these then is a interesting way to look at the idea of death. Goes back to it and he says, look here. The reason we have to separate from the soul from the body is because, you know, the things that most interest us, which is justice, beauty, and the good, these cannot be seen with the eye. They can't be seen. And therefore, to search for them in any way that depends upon the senses is very foolish. And therefore, if they are to be seen, they must not be seen. I mean, they can't be seen through the eyes, and therefore any effort to use the senses would be foolish, and therefore one must withdraw from the interest in the senses in the pursuit of justice, beauty, and the good. Thought, dianoia. So this too is a separation. This is a death. Now, there's a higher kind of thought, which is understanding. They, pursuing thought, thought itself doesn't necessarily mean that you're understanding. Understanding, or dianoia, is when you're seeking for the reasons why the noblest views you have of beauty, justice, and the good are indeed true. That's understanding. So when you can go for the reasons why, you, whatever you think about beauty, justice, and the good, and these are, of course, as you know, uh, the highest terms in Greek philosophy. Beauty and experience into the nature of beauty or beauty itself, as we've talked about, <clears throat> beauty in itself, by itself, with itself, in itself, by itself, that means it's unmixed, pure, right. and with itself and nothing else. This experience, therefore, is an experience of the nature of ultimate reality, because the experience is magnificently beautiful, but when one recognizes in that beauty that one has come in contact with, in fact, a very profound vision, 
which is beautiful, of reality. Now, that's beauty. And justice, as we've talked about it before, just to keep us together, is when everything is balanced in perfect harmony for man and the universe. If you can see that, that's justice. That means, therefore, it is an intelligible, an intelligible, caring universe. Or we should call it a cosmos, because anytime we talk about the universe being intelligible, we mean cosmos rather than universe. And the good, the idea of the good, of course, is beyond both and both dignity and power, and that's called the final ultimate term. Therefore, it deserves the term the good, and sometimes it's called the one. So, when one now is wanting to understand why these things can be said about beauty, about reality, about justice being the intelligible, caring cosmos, and why therefore everything fits together into a harmony, if one can understand the reasons for that, and understand why the idea of the highest term is the good or the one, if you can put that reasons into that, that's dianoia, that's understanding. Right? That's understand. That's Dianoia. Okay. It's so different from what we mean by understanding that I don't mean to be pedantic in any way, but I do think that it's worthwhile preserving the Greek word for it. Dia is through noia nous. It's through the highest part of the mind. Well, then, look here. If that's the case, then it may be that if the only way you can reach that is a final separation of the soul from the body, then you must probably then wait until you drop dead, and then at this moment, perhaps you can then catch a vision of it. Or maybe it can't be acquired at all. Or it can only be acquired when you drop dead. This is his conclusion. So let's take a look what he means by dead and the condition for it now. He says, but you know what? He said, when a person dies, you know, when he goes through this curious process of death, he says, I think when you're pure, when the mind is pure, when one's pure, the soul is pure, then he said, I think it's, it's possible here when you talk about being pure, that the pure shall know ourselves and shall know that which is pure. When? What does that mean? When pure, then you will be with the pure, then you'll be with what's pure. If you are pure, purify the mind, then you will be with the pure. And if you are with the pure, then you shall know ourselves all that is pure. And he says, hey, that's the truth. That's the truth. But what does he mean by that, purification? Well, if one is pure, then you're with the pure. Okay, that band may follow. And, yes, and then we shall know of ourselves all that is pure, whatever that might be. So we have to find out what that would be. So that's another paradox sneaking in here, as well as the whole idea of what a purification is. As well, look here, you know, hope exists for every man who thinks his mind has been purified and made ready to in fact separate and then discover the na very nature of what is pure. And since the person then would be purified or gone through a purification, then he'll be ready for an interesting state of mind, and the state of mind is death. Let's take a look at what he says about this.
All right, now I'm going to read and draw because I'm very good at drawing, as you can tell. I've studied anatomy at length, as you can see in this nude figure here. Um, and does not purification consist in this? Which has been mentioned long ago in our discourse. In separating, two words now, separation and release. Watch the way he uses them. In separating as far as possible the soul from the body. Well then how do you do that? All right, It's a separation of the soul from the body. Well, And does not purification consist in this, which has been mentioned long ago in our discourse, in separating as far as possible the soul from the body, and teaching, here we come now, and teaching and teaching the soul the habit of collecting and bringing itself together right, the habit of collecting and bringing br habit of, uh, teaching the soul the habit of collecting and bringing itself together from from all parts of the body all right look here you got to collect it from all parts of the body and living so far as it can both now as well as hereafter both now as well as hereafter as well as hereafter Alone by itself, freed from the body as if from fetters. So what do you have to do? You have to teach the soul the habit of collecting and bringing itself together from all parts of the body and living as far as it can both now and hereafter, alone by itself, separated from the body, both now as well as hereafter. This is what we call death. This is what we call death. Is it not? A release, you're releasing it, and you're separating it from the body. And we hold true philosophers, and they alone are always most eager to release the soul. And just this, the release and the separation of the soul from the body, is their study. Is it not? This is the object of philosophy. This is philosophy. This is philosophy. Now, that's really an interesting position, you see, because um, one, it assumes, you see, that in my great drawing here, I can make it again, right? the assumption is, you see, that the soul is a living, it is a living, vital, matter of fact, soul in the Greek and Homer Soul and breath are the same. You know, your, your breath, your vitality, that's your soul. And it permeates the body. Wherever the body is, that's where your life is, that's where your soul is extended. Therefore, if you want to bring together the soul from all parts of the body in some way, you are then 
withdrawing it from all parts of the body so it can live alone by itself independent. Now, big question now, so what? What does it see? If it can pull that off, so what? That's curious. You can go home and tell your mother, your father, hey, you know, I just dropped dead. Oh, that's nice, kid. Now can you go out and play basketball? So then the question is, when separated from the soul, from the body, what is it that is encountered? All right? What is it that is encountered? What is it that's encountered, and how does that relate to philosophy? This is a yoga. This is a, this is a yoga. It's a habit teaching the soul the habit of collecting itself and drawing itself. Now he uses the term true philosophers in several ways. One, they alone are always most eager to release the soul, and just this, the release and the separation of the soul from the body, this is their study. That's what it is. And that's why in great places of learning like UCI and and the State California, the State University of Long Beach and LA. That's what they study. They bring people together and they teach them how to take soul flights. It's a very popular course. Next, true philosophers practice dying, dying process, dying, and death, the separation, is less terrible to them to any other man. For true philosophers, they will find pure wisdom nowhere else but in this other world, which is possible to experience both now and hereafter. So what I need is a couple of good quotes. Um, we need to see what it's like when it departs, what it encounters, and how that is related to philosophy. That's one of our primary goals. All right, that's what we want to see, what it encounters. We have to tie it in with wisdom. And what's interesting about this, of course, before we go into wisdom and the experience, I'd like you to bring you to see how wisdom and mystics fit together. And I happen to have a couple of good quotes for you, and I think I'll read them for you. See, this is mysticism, this is yoga, games of yoga, meditation, that kind of stuff. Now, he's going to take an interesting jump here, and it's on this point with wisdom. Right? Now, he's going to touch on something. He doesn't deal with it too much in this dialogue. He touches on it. He deals much more in the Republic with it, but I would like to bring it up and push it. Now he's talking about the virtues, talking about the virtues, and he says, My dear Simeus, I suspect this is not the right way to purchase virtue by exchanging pleasures for pleasures and pains for pains and fear for fear greater for less as if they were coins. But the only right coinage, the only right coinage for which all these things must be exchanged and by means of and with which all these things are bought and sold is wisdom. For courage and self-restraint and justice and in short, true virtue exists only with wisdom. I'm skipping a little bit. But truth is in fact a purification from all these things. And self-restraint and justice and courage and wisdom itself are a kind of purification. It's a purification. That's what wisdom is, it's purification. Ha <laughs> ha, curious notion. 
And I fancy that those men who established the mysteries were not unenlightened, but in reality had a hidden meaning when they said long ago that whoever goes uninitiated and unsanctified to the other world will lie in the mire. But he who arrives there initiated and purified will dwell with the gods. For as they say in the mysteries, the thyrus bearers are many, but the mystics few. And these mystics are, I believe, those who have been true philosophers. And I in my life, so far as I could, left nothing undone and have striven in every way to make myself one of them. Well, now we want to go back. All right. So wisdom is a purification. Wisdom is a purification. He calls himself a mystic. He said he's, he's left nothing undone in his efforts to try to become them and to match them. And that's what a true philosopher is. Well, what is it then when the soul <clears throat> is able to inquire and explore alone by itself? That's where we are. That's what we need. So, let's take a look. Hmm. I'm at uh, 79D, for those of you who want to follow it. When the soul then inquires alone by itself, it departs into the realm of the pure, everlasting, the immortal and the changeless, And being akin to these, there's a kinship, akin to these, it dwells always, it dwells always with them whenever it is by itself and is not hindered. And it has rest from its wanderings and remains always the same, then it remains always the same. Unchanging with the changeless since it has, since it is in communion with it, right? Since it's in communion. Therefore, it's participating in it. This state of the soul, this state of the soul, because it's a state of the soul, when separated from the soul from the body, that's wisdom. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. Now I'm jumping now to uh, 81. This is 79. This is 81. 81A. He goes back and he pulls this together. But the soul, the invisible, which departs into another place, which is like itself, noble, pure, invisible to the real to the realm of the God of the other world in truth to the good 
and wise God, whether, if God will, my soul is soon to go in this soul, which has such qualities and such a nature, straightway and scattered and destroyed when it departs from the body, as most men say, far from it, Cedes and Simeas. But the truth is much rather this. If it departs pure, dragging with it nothing of the body, because it never willingly associated with the body and life, but avoided it and gathered itself into itself alone, since this has always been its constant study, but this means nothing else than that it pursued philosophy aright and really practiced being in a state of death. Or is not this the practice of death? Well, then if it's in such a condition, right? It goes away into that which is like itself, into the invisible, divine, immortal, and wise. And when it arrives there, it is happy and freed from the error and folly and fear and the fierce loves of all the other human ills. And lives in truth through all, right, through all after time with the gods. Then if it is in such a condition, it goes away into that which is, it, is like itself, into the invisible, divine, and immortal. So it goes into the div invisible, the divine, and the immortal, which is akin to it, experiences it. If that's akin to it, then the soul is immortal. And through such experiences can reach that realm, which in the Greek world is the realm of the God, the realm of the divine, and the immortal. And that's the practice of death. So, these are the subjects we wanted to cover. The true philosopher, the one who can pull his stunt off. If he's able to pull that activity off, that practice, that's the experience of death. What he encounters, that's called wisdom. And experiencing that wisdom is nothing other than experiencing the divine and the immortal, and therefore, if the soul is akin to that, it therefore can partake in that way in immortality. Back now to our paradoxes. If, the, if we can say then, is it not likely that the wise will come after him as quickly as they can? And so will any man who has any worthy interest in philosophy as he understands it. And when dead, will they not attain the greatest blessings? Would you not agree that many don't understand why real philosophers or true philosophers desire death? They don't understand why they deserve it, since they've practiced and gone through so much. Nor do they know what kind of death it is, because that's certainly a different idea of death. Therefore, we can go back and say, now we understand this part that we left out earlier and filled it in that death is the separation of the soul from the body. We can separate it from the state of being dead, and therefore the goal of the philosopher is not to experience the state of being dead, but the experience of the separation of the soul from the body. Thank you. Let's have some questions and play for a while. Uh, Good beginning. I don't, I don't understand the distinction between death and the state of being dead. Perhaps. Um, if your body remained alone by itself without the soul, I imagine you wouldn't go back into it. Um, Is that right? Not, not insofar as it remains alone. Thank you. And so long as it remains alone, without a soul, it's likely then to disintegrate even more? Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Would you not say you're only alive when the soul is in the body, not alone by itself? Mm -hmm. Oh, good, good. What part didn't you understand? Aren't they the same thing? If you're asking me, of course, I'll say no. <laughs> you don't want to ask me that. 
You want to see whether you can preserve what difficulty you have in seeing the difference. Let's do it together. Go ahead. If you drop dead, right? would you agree there's said to be a separation? And then this is alone by itself? And this remains alone by itself? Right? Exists alone by itself. Exists alone by itself. Okay. How would you describe? How would you describe that, that this process? That's purification. That's true. But here there is a separation and a release, is it not? Here there's a separation, and the soul is released from the body. But can it not then? Return. So this is when the physical body. Yeah. Away. State of being dead. That's right. right. Whereas the first one can happen while you're alive. Both here as well as hereafter. That's right. That's right. That's why he put it in, which he needed. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Obviously, it's not uh, condoning the help of experience. He's not condoning what? The help of experience. I mean, even though he, under these circumstances, is ready to take the handbook and kill himself, but it is only because he is a true philosopher and has practiced all these things beforehand. And is well, the hemlock is this. Right. I'm, but I'm, I'm trying to understand. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's kind of outside us and yet within tonight's lecture. Is what is the difference between? Mm -hmm. Socrates being ready to not defend himself and hence from one angle committing suicide you could say and the guys in Heaven Gate who for a pseudo philosophical reason or what to them was true philosophy did the same type of separation of the body and the soul so they thought you know, I mean, God no. bless them, their souls are in that UFO going wherever they're going. So, um, yes, yes. But they don't expect to come back. Right? They don't expect to come back. This is not a training. This is not a discipline to try to separate. This is a, a we call it today, uh, those people have uh, near-death experiences. And, we're, and according to Houston Smith and some others, those that have had good acid trips might re might go through something similar, right? Or yes. uh, uh, I've been through that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Well, then, that's a separation. That's not this. That's not the hemlock. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, you said that wasn't a discipline. I thought it was. I did say it was a discipline. Yeah, oh, this is not a discipline. Got it. Okay. I thought you said it wasn't. No. This physical. This is. Let's call this dropping dead. Right. You don't need much practice for that. The right. interesting thing is yeah. that since I had that separation, I've never been scared of dropping dead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah, of course. And beforehand, I was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a natural consequence. Yeah. So long as you know there's a higher reality than the every day, day one that you walk through, you're no longer worried about this being all there is. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Sir? How does, how does this dialogue relate chronologically to the symposium? I haven't got the faintest idea. In terms of which one was written first and second? Well, I know this one was probably one of the last. Uh, I'm just wondering if it's two weeks. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. 30 years, 30 years. Yeah, yeah. I have never paid any attention to I know there are many arguments that try to date the early, the middle, and the late dialogues. The reason I'm trying to date it is... Um, yeah, the point might be better. Yeah. The point is, uh, I would expect a dialogue like this to come from Diatima, not Socrates, based on the symposium. Oh, unless, unless, oh, unless oh. this was separated. Theoretically, 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 this comes after. That's right, because in the symposium, there's no evidence that Socrates ever experienced it. That's right. But here he's talking first person along. Yes, quite true. That's the way I like it. Whether, they, whether 
historically can be defined first, second, or third. Theoretically, this should come. Yeah. 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 Good. 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 One, two. Yeah. Sir. In the Christian tradition, there's, uh, I think, reference made to this a number of times. Uh, one of them, for example, is in, uh, it's at the end of a prayer called the Prayer of St. Francis. Mm-hmm. The closing lines are something like, uh, it is through forgiving that one is forgiven. Mm-hmm. It is through dying mm-hmm. that one attains everlasting eternal life. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and also yeah. in the Bible, that's uh, there's various quotes and so forth about the dying. Uh, do you see that as a, a parallel to this? The key, the key for me is whether or not it's possible to experience it now before you drop dead. Yes, and yeah. I, that's the way I take yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And if it is possible then for these people who have taken that kind of trip or journey, Socrates calls it a journey, uh, the, cr- the crisis would be that then they no longer need faith. They know. Right? They don't have to then believe that there's uh, this or that. They've experienced it. Right? That's it. So it, it would, I think that's true, by the way. I think Meister Eckhart could be cited among that group. And of course, uh, um, at different times in church's history, those people had difficulties with the orthodoxy, including St. Francis. But uh, I think it's, uh, just to make sure, that I think this kind of experience is transcultural and transcultural also in the sense of being over time as well. And it is not the exclusive property of any particular group. Though some civilizations or cultures explore it in more and more detail than others necessarily. Like I think in the Tibetan you get this much, much, much stronger and much more detailed. Uh, You get it clearly, much more clearly in Plotinus and you get, so Plato and Plotinus are strong. Yeah, yeah. Yes? When you raise your hand to your lips, you're called on twice. Yes? Um, if we look at it from the near-death experience of Kubler-Ross, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kubler-Ross. isn't it, at least with some who are ready for it and are philosophers, mm-hmm. who would be near an execution, um, I'm thinking of Dostoevsky, oh. they do go through a near-death experience since he's a philosopher, so it makes sense kind of, mm-hmm. this is um, a few yeah. weeks after symposium, mm-hmm. now he has actually experienced it because yeah. now he's facing his own death, yeah. so yeah. that facing his own death would allow him to have the near-death experience, so it's mm-hmm. first-hand from Socrates' point of view rather than yeah. Yeah. earlier on. Yeah, with the, uh, uh, the additional point that for uh, Socrates, this has been a practice he's been engaged in for a long period of time. I understand, but, all but I'm seeing then not saying anything against what you just said. I think you're quite right. That a good way to uh, get much more intense about life is to realize you're going to drop dead shortly. Yeah, yeah, it helps. Um, I mentioned the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's when the body dies, the soul is spoken of as seeing a clear light. Does that have anything to do with this stuff? Um, in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, um, there are three uh, planes they call the Chikai the Chanyad and the Sitba, Bardo plane. Bardo, Bardo and word plane are the same. And at the moment of death, depending upon uh, the degree to which a person has practiced meditation, they can extend that, that light experience or the Chikai state 
And for some people who never even thought of it or have never been exposed to philosophy, according to the Book of the Dead, it lasts only the twinkling of an eye. So that's relatively short. But uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead is a funerary work that, as you probably know, it's read into the person at the time of their death for 49 days, especially the first three days intensely. And it's to awaken, it's to awaken the departed soul to the fact that they are dead and to try to get them to turn around, regardless of which one of these bardos they are in, to go back to this state and experience that. If so, then they either get off the wheel of life or they get a much better reincarnation. So, yes. Does he talk about what one is to do after experiencing this and being back in the world, the other part of this cycle? Yeah. Yeah. Um, The clearest, the clearest exploration of that, if you, if you can take what we're describing here as, the, as analogous to the allegory of the cave in the upper world, and if you take this highest experience of wisdom to be equivalent to seeing the nature of the sun in its own place in the upper world, and uh, freed from the false beliefs about the nature of the self and reality. If you take that to be analogous, then I can suggest something. So if you accept that idea. The, see, the allegory of the cave is really the allegory of the cave and the upper world. Because once this is seen, then according to the allegory of the cave and the upper world, he must then descend once more, only this time, he voluntarily goes into that world, and he must take his place among the prisoners and play out his role of teacher. And that's the second part of the allegory of the cave in the upper world. Um, it's a magnificent allegory. It runs for some uh, uh, 12 full pages. And if you're interested in that, the most interesting thing about it is his evaluation of what it is like to be here. And uh, he says, you know, when the philosopher returns to that, he then quotes Homer. And when Odysseus was in the land of the dead, he meets Achilles. And he says to Achilles, you know, what's it, you know, what's it like? And Achilles says, you know, I would much prefer to be the poorest slave to a landless master than be master of all the dead that lie here. Well, that's the quote that Socrates uses to describe the state of mind of the philosopher having to return into the underworld. You know, if it was, he would rather be there, <clears throat> but he takes this on as a duty, but he makes an interesting statement about it. He says that's a duty only if society and the state in any way contributed to his development and nurture. So it's conditional. So this is a kind of a bodhisattva image out of Buddhism. But if the only condition of the bodhisattva the image here is if in some way the state helped and supplied you with some principles of your own growth and nurture, in which case it's a payback. But if not, not. Is it possible to get there without the state oh, somehow yeah. helping? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, my uncle Louis. Yeah. yeah. Only trouble with my uncle Louis was he, he he was also known for lying, and so we couldn't tell when he was young. So. <laughs> but uh, Burke, you know, the great work on cosmic consciousness. Uh, he came to that experience. He was reading poetry one night with some friends, and he walked away. I walked down the street in a rather good state, and bammo, he got a full enlightenment experience, knocked him out. Right. So it is possible to, to enter into this state of wisdom without yoga, without all of this, depending upon unknown no, no, factors. But, but that poem was written by somebody else, so the state had helped towards... Oh, does the state help? No, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, is it you said 
the, it's your duty to return. Yes, if only, the state. Only if the state helped. And I'm saying, mm. I don't think it's possible since we all learn from other human beings. Oh, I see what you mean. We, we are in a state helping one another. Yeah, but it's impossible, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. th this the guy had a yeah. piece of poetry. There's something which okay. is going to the, take you out okay, of the cave. Okay, then you would be saying that the society of people he came together helped create the conditions for the, yeah, I'm um, the saying experience. Nobody, and nobody therefore can he, unshackle themselves. Yeah, 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 okay. I mean, maybe Buddha or, you yeah. know, yeah, well, that, that's that's uh, that's certainly worth saying, and I wouldn't deny that. Uh, whatever set of conditions have helped produce that itself, you are tied to it, and you should in some way complement. Yeah, 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 yeah. But for Plato, he says, if the state didn't help you, forget it. Yeah. Uh, some other people had some spin on it. I knew this guy once, and he worked with some Indians, and they put him up on a mountaintop for like 35 days and messed around with him with very little food and very little water. And uh, they went up top there and they said, uh, did you see the bird? And the guy says, yeah, the bird went out of my head. Well, they, they beat him up. And they said, you never let the bird go out of your head. And you know, he did some more work and stuff. And then they came down later and they, um, you know, he asked, why don't you let the bird go out of your head? Uh, and they said, because if, if you let the bird go out of your head, you've been doing this for yourself. And if you ask for something for yourself, you, you run the risk of, you know, the risk of failures or something. And what they said is mm -hmm. that you have to come back down to earth, keep the bird inside, and then when everybody and connect to the earth, and then when everybody got the bird, supposedly there would be a big bird that would come out of the earth. Ah, okay. <laughs> so they had, a, they had a different spin on this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, uh, as a matter of fact, in the, in the Republic, um, Socrates points out that there are people in, in his group that he knew of who did reach that state and they have nothing to do with the state and, they want, and he calls those people, those who think of, themselves in, think of themselves as living in the aisles of the blessed experiencing that wondrous vision and they have nothing to do with the state. So in that case, that would be someone who let the bird out. The idea is that no. if you don't ask, well, their idea no. is if you ask for anything for yourself, mm -hmm. there's no. very few what, good spirits or godly no. spirits. No. It's only the devil that gives you, gives you mm -hmm. what you want. It's not for everyone else or something. Yeah, yeah. No. That's a different take on it. Yes, and that presupposes there's a demonic element in the universe, too, which That's is true. not, yeah. That's right. yeah, which you, is you not present that. here. Okay, you assume that it's not present. That's right. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Well, it isn't, at least it isn't in the Hellenic. Pla Platonic world. There's uh, also a particular medicine wheel that I uh, talked about where uh, you work your way around it and the fourth position is called ego, mm -hmm. which is a, is a land and a heavenly animal. Mm -hmm. And it goes up into the heavens and attains some kind of divine knowledge and then it brings back to mm -hmm. the earth as a messenger mm -hmm. to yeah. And, uh, yeah. So there's that same kind of. Uh, yeah, compensatory in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's certain societies that insist that if someone has these profound experiences, they should return with something. Even a dance step would be good in a dancing culture. You know, a song. Yeah. Well, some people have enjoy dancing in a That's dancing a culture. Or shamanic journeys. And so a shamanic to journey. Go to the other Healing, yeah, especially healing, and prophecies. Yeah, that's Empedocles, too. Um, one reason why you have to get back to the cave is the fact that the good, the just, the beautiful, it's perfect. So there is, a, from mm. that mindset, there is mm. no need for any, it's everlasting, mm. there's, it mm -hmm. is unchangeable, mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. no need for it to change, and it's un. I mean, maybe I don't know which is which, whether it's unchangeable because it, it is perfect. Either way, th that is a uni universe which mm -hmm. is out of mm -hmm. time. And mm -hmm. if you want to act yeah. on the universe, yeah. you have to get back into the cave because that's the mm -hmm. only universe which is imperfect and 
needs perfection, if that makes sense. Well, in the Republic, Socrates is anticipating, as it were, his own death, because he says, you know, that's a risk, and to the degree to which you differ and function differently, you run the risk of hostility from your fellows and may, in the end, put you to death. So, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's the ethical drama and the political, social, religious drama. Yeah. Did you make an attempt at interpreting that drug behind you, whatever it is? Uh, ever since I've been in your classes, you draw that little uh, spirit, and if you look on the outer periphery of this thing, you see your little spirit diagram with the wings on it. In the blue area? Oh, that's magnificent. Tonka. So is that a bunch of people who are all like, you know, oh. sending yeah. out their spirits and making can... Yeah. Uh, really, I think that's something that uh, someone who has skill in reading Tonkas, and I don't. I have a Tonka of my own, <laughs> 18th century. Pardon me? Are, are those, in the blue border, those things that are, that are yeah. taken off, are those actually your figurative uh, uh, soul separation? Or, I mean, they look like what you No, this is mounted. This is, that's mounted. That's the Tonka that's mounted. No, no look at the blue background. Along here? Yeah, see all that stuff? Yeah. yeah. What is that? I, as I say, you, uh, I would like to be able to tell you, but I don't it, know. It looks like, it looks like what yeah. you're doing little picture. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the tree of enlightenment. So um, it's a magnificent... Uh, we should have someone come in and give us a talk on Tonkas. Mm -hmm. I have one I'd like them to look at, too. Yeah. Can you talk about the ramifications of dropping dead without your previous training, philosophical training? No, I, I don't think they're... Uh, um, what you're asking is whether or not... I presume you're asking whether or not this experience can be had without the purification. Yeah. Or is it bringing something like reincarnation? Yeah. Um, Tying the soul to the body still. Well, what's going to happen if they don't have the purification and they drop dead? Well, there are many people who have tried the drug route and have had, you know, terrible experiences and magnificent experiences. And uh, perhaps you can say that people that weren't ready for this kind of experience should avoid it. Weren't you asking about when the body dies, what happens if you're not purified? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, I thought you were talking about the mind. So, what, what is the experience? Let me change it. Pardon me? What is the experience yeah, the, for the what separation? The of dropping dead. Okay, physically dropping dead. Yeah. Without being purified. Yeah. Does he get into that at all? Well, um, <coughs> according to... <coughs> According to the uh, Phaedo in the end, there's a whole myth. And in that myth, they talk about what it's like for period people who do experience dropping dead without the purification. And what they carry with them is their view of reality. And, uh, you know, people have rather strange views of reality, and that's what they act out without the body. No, this separation now, this is the journey of the soul into the next world, right? And therefore, if there are all kinds of beliefs in there about how terrible it is and how demonic it is, then that's what they face. They face the contents of their own mind. That's what you take with you, according to the Phaedo. You take intel your, your nurture, what you've nurtured and developed, that's what you take with you. So. Uh, be careful what you put in your head, you may experience it. I don't know what all of these great films are doing to people. <laughs> <laughs> but it's probably polluting the mind. It's probably, I think it's polluting the mind. No. It's probably not as bad as what some people get in an average communications class. You know, everything is relative and nothing, there's nothing to anything, you know the types. One of the theories of um, mantra yoga is the fact mantra. that the whole practice you're doing mm -hmm. is that if you can have the name of your God, whatever name, mm -hmm. your mantra, on your mind at the moment of death, yes. 
that yes. will cause a release and you're doing all the practice mm -hmm. of years yeah. and years of repeating it it's yeah. just so that you don't forget it at that moment yeah. of separation yeah. if you can keep it with you know the vision of Ram or whoever Krishna, Krishna or whatever then at that moment you go into that state so even if you have a very pure notion of a god or a mantra to the degree that you have these other notions in your head then you're carrying aloft a very fine idea with a baggage of these irreconcilable notions and I presume a person then would have to experience what that's like to have such a duality and in the Tibetan Book of the Dead which I always recommend uh, that's the very story that takes place in this bardos yeah. Because as one faces the contents of one's own one's mind, one goes through each one of these three bardos until they finally are reincarnated. Yeah, that's a fine story. Some of these Roshis, they say, uh, I'm, I'm dying, no, I'm leaving, I'm dying, they sit down and say goodbye to death. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, Muktananda did. Yeah, yeah. Was he the only one? No, but I know that that took place with Muktananda. Yeah, that's called the Mahasamadhi. Yeah, yeah. Go out at the dropping dead at the same time, pulling off a samadhi experience. You know, I mean, if you have nothing else to do when you drop dead, you know, go off in a samadhi. Uh, as you get into the practice of being a philosopher, for example, I know the Tibetans, they do work also in dream time to yes. discipline the mind. Yes. So for yes. instance, Mm -hmm. Is there anything about the practice of uh, becoming a yes. philosopher? Yes, yes. Um, uh, that's the, the Symposium, the Phaedrus, the Republic, the Parmenides. Uh, it's really, Plato is really a work that combines all of those dialogues where you can see it much more clearly apart from this uh, magnificent literary form that he uses and he uses with such skill and artistry is Plotinus. Plotinus goes into it much more. See, Plotinus has the same metaphysics as Plato of course. Right? He has the one or the good intelligent soul and his whole writing is to explain that very thing how to go through the or what it takes the disciplines and uh, uh, book four, he has six. Book four deals with the whole process of the soul. And um, he does much of what Plato does, but he puts in much more details. And he, and also metaphysics. Do I have time? No, I don't have time. Um, in the Platonic tradition, there's a split, there's a major split between um, Plato, Plotinus, and then Iamblichus, who introduces a different stage of thought. And the major difference is precisely on this issue that we're on tonight. See, Here's the problem. Let's see if I can give it to you. Let this line represent the stages that the soul goes through until it reaches that point that we were talking about where it experiences the nature of wisdom. To, uh, <clears throat> to make that claim means, what is it that the soul is? What's the soul? If the soul can experience that directly in itself, by itself, then what's the difference between the soul and wisdom? For Plato, as we were looking at tonight, there isn't any. In Plotinus, there isn't any. 
Porphyry wants to come in and say, and then the people that follow Porphyry, including Proclus, Damascus, uh, Cyrenius, uh, um, uh, what's his name, um, Persianus, they want to say that there is a fundamental difference between the soul and wisdom and the intelligible. It's a fundamental difference that uh, you can come as close as you please, but you can't make it. There are limits, you know, they have that, you reach it asymptotically, but you never really get there, because they want to say there's a fundamental difference between the soul's essence and its power and its activity. What we're talking about here is, there is an activity of the soul, right? There's an activity of the soul. This is an activity of the soul. Right? For that to take place, there must be some power that the soul must possess. And if there is a power, sometimes this is called the faculty, by the way, but it's really dunamis, it's power. Then, if it can do that, then you must be able to say something about the nature of the souls, the substance of the soul, or the essence of the soul. And for this to be said means that um, for something in, for, for anything at all that can turn upon itself and see its own nature, that very thing can't be a physical thing because only physical things can touch at one point, right? Pretzels can touch at a couple of points, but not every point upon every point can touch. And therefore, if this is a turning about of the soul upon itself, since the soul is a state of wisdom, then that can be done only by something that is not physical, and therefore the nature of the soul must not be physical at all, but must be incorporeal. And if it can do that, this ability to turn upon itself is called, its basic uh, nature or being is usia, or uh, sometimes translated as essence. What does essence mean when used correctly? It means that power in the soul that can turn upon itself to know itself. So uh, there's a split in the Platonic tradition between those who think that the essence of the soul, the essence of the soul, is the same as being. Whereas uh, Iamblichus, as I said before, and others who follow him, uh, want to deny that, want to say it just approaches it as close as you please, that kind of stuff, like an epsilon limit in, in mathematics. So that's normal. So would you, would you say that uh, Iamblichus and afterwards has a more developed um, understanding of the soul, or uh, well, to, to, it's not uh, that big of a difference. Uh, well, you see, the basic difference is that for people like Iamblichus and Proclus, whenever you make a logical distinction, whenever you make a logical distinction, it parallels an ontological distinction. So that if I can make these distinctions in thought, well, there must be something in the nature of reality that corresponds to them. So whatever I then experience in the realm of thought, then that must be true about the nature of reality. That's taking logical distinctions as a basis for ontological distinctions. Proclus, pardon me, Plotinus, clearly Plotinus is saying, no, no, look here, that's not, no, no, no. <laughs> It's what you encounter in your highest experience that you must use as a basis for making distinctions in ontology. Ontology is a fancy word, by the way, excuse me. Ontology is a fancy word for the study of being, ontos from the Greek, right? So the study of being is ontology. So uh, one person is going with thought, confident that with thought, you make these distinctions, and these distinctions must mirror ontological distinctions in being. Plotinus is saying, well, I'll tell you, I just had a trip and a journey of the soul separating from the body. It's happened often. Let me tell you what I encountered. And then he makes his distinctions in terms of his experience, not in terms of his thought. 
the, even though they both have experience, they both have thought, there's a priority of one over the other in each thinker. So for Proclus, he's going to make, he's here, right? He's here. Though they obviously have a great value to experience, but a much greater regard for experiences in Plotinus and Plato rather than, than logical. And that separates them. So the uh, best thing to do is to uh, make up your mind to read both. <laughs> okay. Thank you for joining me this evening. <laughs>